So good afternoon and welcome to the chemical biology uh, webinar from, from the SEM. Uh, this webinar has been coordinated by, by Sonsoles Martin. Sonsoles, if you want, you can uh, introduce our speakers today. Thank you very much, Mark. Welcome, everybody. Yes, it's a pleasure for me to, to have this webinar. This is the first webinar of the group of uh, chemical biology. I'm going to introduce you the two speakers that we have uh, today. Uh, the first one is Professor Germán Rivas from the Center of Biological Research, Margarita Salas. And, uh, well, very briefly, um, uh, Germán uh, performed he, his PhD in chemistry at the Universita Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Uh, he, had, uh, he followed two postdoctoral studies, one, the first one in the States and the second in Switzerland. And uh, he came back to, to Spain. He was a scientific titular from 1995, group leader in 1996, and investigador científico in uh, 2006, and his professor of research, professor de investigación since uh, 2015. And regarding Ruth, Ruth also performed her, her PhD in chemistry in the Universidad Autónoma of Madrid. And uh, she performed a postdoc postdoctoral stay at the University of Cambridge. And then he, she was, uh, he was awarded with a, a Juan de la Cierva contract. And uh, in 2008, he, she went to the Institute of the Química Medica of the CSIC. And since uh, 2009, she's a scientific titular. And uh, she's um, uh, uh, now in, at the uh, Center for Biological Research, Margarita Sass, where she's a group leader as well. Thank you very much to the two speakers. Thank you so much for being here and accepting the invitation. So, Maybe we can start with the first speaker, Mark? Okay. Yes. So it's my pleasure to introduce you the first uh, lecture by Professor Rivas entitled um, Biology from Scratch, Rec Reconstituting Minimal Cell-like Systems from the Bottom Up, a Challenge for Mechanistic, Chemical, and Synthetic Biology. Thank you very much, Herman. Um, I forgot to tell you that you can write your questions in the chat of the Zoom session, if you are connected or by YouTube as well. And we will have some minutes at the end of the talk by Professor Rivas to uh, ask uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonsoles, for your kind invitation and also to the group of chemical biology of the Spanish uh, Biochemistry, Biochemical Society uh, for for me, it's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, this afternoon. Uh, the title is a bit longer, but the idea was to give you an idea of what I had in mind, uh, trying to uh, give you an overview of what is now uh, uh, the research on building synthetic cells from uh, the bottom up, which I think is a, a, a grand challenge for chemical and synthetic biology. Our laboratory uh, uh, for the last 25 years is uh, in, engaged in understanding the molecular mechanism uh, uh, responsible for the bacteria, bi biochemical organization of the bacterial division machinery, the division. And our idea is to our path, scientific path, is to reconstitute from the bottom up minimal divisions that will reproduce essential features of the bacterial division in controlled cell-like environments in the absence of cells, trying to narrow the gap between a cellular system and synthetic systems. Uh, reverse engineering bacterial division will hopefully provide at the long term novel tools to curb bacterial division and our program integrates mechanistic biochemistry, biophysics, and bottom-up synthetic biology. And it is framed on the quest of this talk, today's talk, building synthetic cells from scratch. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will give you an overview on the quest of synthetic life, uh, how synthetic biology uh, began uh, as 
introducing the engineer uh, uh, concepts of a cell as a factory, then I will briefly comment on artificial cell, minimal cells, and proto cells. And I will I will go to the challenges both in assembly and synthesis and enable tools, biofactories and society. And if I had time, I will give you a brief overview on what uh, uh, is being done in the Europe and also in Spain on synthetic cell research. Uh, synthetic biology aims to design and synthesize novel or bio-inspired systems with valuable functions, even those that do not exist in nature. Uh, it introduced the engineering perspective to study biological processes. In this regard, cells can be considered as factories that carry out tasks that can be programmed or engineered uh, to produce uh, added value uh, products or even knowledge. In this regard, one of the main aims of synthetic biology is assembling a minimal living unit with programmable functionality. And the idea is to master the capabilities of a biological system or a natural cell or even the molecular blocks. Uh, and the idea is to master these capabilities uh, to build a synthetic cell. That, and this uh, mastering will contribute to understand that this is very important, the basic principles of life and how it emerged from non-living organisms, and also will provide novel tools to solve uh, important problems for society, environmental or health related. Many of the achievements of uh, synthetic biology have resulted from top-down approaches in which a pre-existing cell has been modified. And in this regard, using engineer, engineering genetic circuits, biological modules, and synthetic pathways to reprogram organisms. And in this way, we were able to produce pharmaceuticals or other interesting products. And this is what is called the top down approach. Uh, also, in this line will be the synthesis of minimal cells. In, and this is the work by Craig Venter and his laboratory. And they create a minimal cells by selecting, or create or produce minimal cells by selectively removing components from a, from a, normal, from a natural genome. And, there, and then they were able to reduce that genome. Uh, and the functional properties of many of these genes are still unknown. And therefore, this will main leave open many questions. In this regard, the latest version of this minimal uh, cell contains uh, around 480 genes and is able to uh, divide with a relatively normal morphology. But the genes that are required for that are known, some of them and others are not known. And this min genomically minimal cell offer an interesting model for understanding bacterial physiology. And also it will give us clues for chemical and synthetic biology, as I will tell you in a minute. But all this progress, uh, as you say, as you can imagine, uh, had uh, also a lot of uh, unknowns. And many of the things are related with the fact that functional properties of these re-engineering cells and how they are controlled is not very well understood, which limits uh, the further progress in this top-down approach. Uh, fundamental limitations on this um, of understanding have uh, fostered uh, the complementary bottom-up approach of synthetic biology, in which a scientist aims to redesign and reconstruct biological parts or systems with increasing levels of complexity towards uh, assembling a minimal cell-like scaffold. Uh, in this regard, uh, building life or lifelike systems from the bottom up will be very important to understand the origins of life and biological self-organization. It will also introduce, uh, had the advantages of simplicity because artificial cells 
are simpler environments to study biological phenomena and to understand and uh, see and to understand an engineer more control uh, and efficient functionalities in different frameworks also had benefits regarding regulatory and security issues uh, this is uh, still in progress that is uh, the way to standardize the these uh, molecular elements uh, that will be very important to facilitate further progress and clearly it will be very important to connect the two approaches uh, in order to and to achieve or going to this question mark a, a bit better this is the roadmap it's a, a scenario of synthetic cell research and here you see from natural cells and non-natural elements you can get systems modules and parts you will be able to get these minimal cell like systems in which some of the important functions of a cell like metabolism formation of self organization will be assembled and integrated these modules to do that we will need the enable tools that i will i will tell you about in a minute and from here we will be able to explode uh, exploit uh, these uh, developments uh, for solving problems and also it will be important for the society as i will tell you later these are more or less the general impact uh, from basic research and also from technology we we will be able or we are in in the uh, trying to understand lifelike molecular systems functional modules this is an important problem at the moment, integrating these functional modules. And hopefully in 20, 30 years, maybe we will be able to have autonomous replicating cells. These developments, scientific developments, will also lead to technological developments like cell-free systems that are already um, well developed, drug delivery systems, uh, programmable bioreactors, and probably in the future, we will get more health related uh, uh, applications besides drug delivery systems uh, one of the main challenges of this uh, approach uh, bottom up approach is to define the complexity level required for life like properties to emerge and how we can integrate modules both in time and space to build these autonomous systems this to me is one of the main challenges at the moment, but also had is a very intriguing um, um, issue for a chemical biologist or synthetic biologist or chemists in general. And achieving these challenges will require collaboration and integration of disciplines and knowledge from life uh, science and physical chemical science to engineer and other disciplines and as you can see here this will be the bottom up approach from a container up to get uh, what will be something in between a cell and a non-living uh, entity and this is more or less a very important uh, challenge for the next 20 years in my opinion this also connect with what will be uh, how could, could we will be able to understand macromolecular organization and cell function and this will probably lead to biochemistry 2.0 in which we will be able to understand master complexity how to understand mechanistically how the elements of subcellular machines are organized in time and space and coordinated one to another in this multiple network of interactions to function and this uh, has been uh, uh, organized at the moment as a discipline that is minimal bottom up biology will be like uh, also you can put here chemistry because most of the minimal biologists nowadays are chemists in which they are integrating these molecular systems into these functional modules and this uh, is part of nature was uh, covering this topic uh, recently bottom up biology and also Bruce Alberts that was the well-known biochemist uh, and was the 
president of the American Association, the American uh, the, the National Academy of Science, and also editor of science, uh, uh, elaborate about that in an editorial of science uh, 10 years ago, and among other issues regarding this challenge of synthetic biology, he was in introducing the one that I'm covering today, the importance of elaborating the chemistry of subcellular machines uh, to understand the chemistry of life. Besides these uh, uh, aspects that are um, deal, uh, uh, that deal with specific interactions, also nowadays uh, is becoming more and more important that to understand the biochemical or chemical organization of cellular machines, we uh, not only need to understand the specific interactions between the components, but also the non-specific interactions associated with the environments in which these uh, assemblies are located and have evolved to function that will introduce very interesting uh, physical chemical phenomena that are now being uh, 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 studied uh, very much by many groups that are the issues, the impact of macromolecular crowding, interfacial and surface interactions and phase separation on uh, macromolecular interaction. I will not cover that, but I will go through it in some of the examples. And as I said at the beginning, the, the, among the challenges, the first one will be assembly and synthesis, reconstituting lifelike molecular systems and integrating functional modules in natural and artificial cells. And among the, the molecular systems, they will have to uh, deal with very essential processes in a cell, like information, those regarding uh, nucleic acid transactions, self-organization that will be cytoskeleton or uh, interactions, uh, how, how the shape of a container is controlled, and also metabolism. Uh, this is just three uh, energy, gener energy uh, generation, metabolic pathways, etc. Uh, I can put more. Uh, there are groups that they are putting even at eight different modules, duplication, division, transport, membrane protein insertion, etc. Metabolism. And even in the small genomically minimal cell with only 400, 500 genes, uh, many of these uh, processes have been um, uh, carried out, which is very intriguing. And this is from a chemical, a recent a review in an important chemical journal in which they, um, they make it cartoons on this issue of the importance of the modular approach, how we had to integrate these functional modules to build synthetic cells with increasing complexity. And this not only includes a learning from nature, but also learning from chemistry and from material science. And this is, uh, I think, is self-explanatory. What uh, this uh, is highly recommendable, this review. Um, among the enabled tools, uh, uh, now probably a, a, a big effort had been uh, done on cell-like compartments. And now we had many ways of generating a container. That is the first thing that you need to uh, assemble a cell-like system. Um, and you can have uh, liposomes or you can have other compartments from polymersomes, pr proteasomes, etc. Even you can have hydrogels that had been studied as components of these um, uh, containers. I mean, a lot of chemistry and material science going on here, also including the formation of liquid-liquid uh, phase separation and coacervates to put inside the containers. Uh, also here, it will be very important nanotechnology. And uh, here you can see, also we need a lot of molecular biology and molecular en uh, genetic engineering. 
a lot of microfabrication and microfluidics is very important, etc. Um, and uh, I am putting a couple of examples of these cell like compartments that at the moment you can also get multi compartmentalized hybrid system in which you can have the protein system in synthetic cells in two different cells, and then you can get uh, uh, the synthesis in individual cells, and then you can combine the contents of the two cells. This is even more complicated in which you can get a, an energy self-sufficient synthetic compartment in which a synthetic cell that will be the large one uh, will encapsulate a, a small one that will be an organelle. This will go here inside and it will be possible to generate ATP when you expose to green light. And the internal ATP drives the reactions that are inside the big a cell. This will is called the small cell or organelle, and this is the big cell. If you uh, if you trigger la green light, you can get reactions here driven by ATP that is produced inside the small compartment, uh, and they will not operate if you uh, uh, shine with a, a light with a, another wavelength, like for example the red in this case. This is just for you to know that these are already enabled tools that will allow you to control these reactions. And I think this is very, very interesting. Also, uh, it's important the, the development of cell-free system in which you had the core transcription and translational processes inside the container and you can build or you can produce uh, the proteins inside the container in a more or less uh, controlled control manner. Uh, here, probably the drawback is, uh, and for the moment, the um, concentration to control in a precise way the protein concentration. Other uh, challenges, uh, I'm going to now uh, analyze two of them. That is achievement large scale behaviors in minimal cell like systems with the Go, find long-term goal of synthesizing a cell cycle, a complete cell cycle. And uh, a very hot uh, research area at the moment is interfacing natural and synthetic cell systems, interfacing biology with the non-living. Also other issues that will take longer will be to get synthetic organelles and synthetic morphogenes and also going into uh, solving pathological dysfunctions of cellular machines and also engineering biology with evolution, but this is long-term problems. Uh, going to the cell cycle, this will be, this is the natural cell cycle, replication, segregation, division and growth. And this will be what will happen when you introduce a container. And now we had to uh, try to get all these elements inside the container to build a full synthetic cell cycle. This will be all the steps that had to be fulfilled. And as you can imagine, there are many. Some of them have been uh, are in progress, but the integration of all of them is, uh, is uh, will need at least 10 years minimum. But this is a big uh, enterprise, and we are working on part of this uh, area in the in the blue uh, stages. Mm. For example, in the case of replication, this has been uh, already accomplished partially. That is, the replication of DNA inside the liposomes had been achieved with the cell-free a system and is a, I think it's a very interesting and elegant accomplishment that you can get DNA replication inside this container using FI29 proteins from the group of the late Margarita Salas. Mm. Uh, coming back to the division part that is the one that I am more involved, here you will need not only the container but also to get symmetry breaking, deformation, and final, eventually, division. 
but this is easy to put in the middle, but it's, it's, a, big, uh, it's a big challenge. But the interesting part that in all the cases, in all the division machineries, the first part is relatively similar, uh, both in prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and archaea. You need to uh, assemble a ring, a constricting ring, at the membrane. And I think this is interesting because studying whatever uh, system will also give you information that can be transport, I mean, transfer to other division system. And in our case, we are working with this FTHZ ring. We study, we reconstitute the, the division ring in, in many cytomimetic media, and we study the inter FTHZ is the main component of the ring that is here. I don't know if it's somewhere around, but the idea is this the ring. I will, I will tell you later. And the idea is that we are studying uh, the properties of this FTHZ protein that uh, form the ring in, in the bacterial cells in different membrane systems that are control systems and artificial cell systems. And the final idea is to uh, pre, uh, define more precise conditions to reconstruct minimal divisions. And here you can see from the simplest one will be a nanodisc, a very simple membrane, supported by layers and different kinds of membranes. Um, I will focus on, on the vesicles inside because it's more interesting. And this is how by using biochemistry, uh, biochemical control uh, uh, systems, like the, this is FTHZ is the main protein of the ring. And when it's a GTP uh, binding protein that also hydrolyzes the GTP. And the idea is that when you add GTP, this is the monomers. And when you add GTP from outside, and this is a permeable vesicle that you can trigger reactions inside from adding ligands from outside, you can get uh, these uh, structures that are polymers inside the polymer fibers inside the, the, the vesicle in a biochemical control manner. In fact, this reaction is exactly the same that we use in solution to study the formation of the polymers in solution. And it's, it's, it's an interesting biochemical experiment in a cell-like environment. More recently, we, uh, we integrate uh, uh, we, the, 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 the ring formation had been integrated with proteins that oscillate uh, and they are able to go from one pole to the other in a cell. And these are the proteins that uh, are, are, are able to position in the, the ring in the middle. And this had been accomplished. And after many years of effort, uh, it will be possible to localize in the center uh, the ring in a cell-like container. And as you can see here, the proteins, uh, the mean oscillating proteins that are uh, going from one pole to the other, and they are inhibitors of FTHZ in the middle, and they make like a symmetry breaking, and you are able to get the ring formation uh, in the middle. But this is not constricting yet, and this is the next step. The next step will be to control not only the organization of the polymer inside the, the cell containers, but also to enhance constriction by adding more elements. And this is what we are doing at the moment. And this will be also, again, a lot of chemistry and a lot of um, biochemistry around. We are incorporating also the elements I mentioned before that is crowding and phase separation to uh, connect these physical chemical um, processes with membrane transformation. And also we are trying to uh, extract lessons from these genomically minimal bacteria uh, to being able to divide a, a minimal cell. And among the elements that we are interested uh, of incorporating from the, this is the genomically minimal cell in a cartoon by David Goodsell, the idea will be to incorporate elements uh, to uh, increase membrane curvature. And among them, 
Well, we already had these aspects that are the proteins I just mentioned, FTZ and other cytoskeletal proteins, but we are interested in incorporating also uh, lipids with a, a certain geometry. We are also interested in incorporating elements that link the chromosome with the membrane. And maybe because this uh, genomically minimal bacteria does not have a wall, uh, it contains lipoproteins that crowd the surface and help to maintain the integrity of a wall, uh, wall less container. And this is something that we would like to explore, not only us, but many others. Uh, let me go to the other point that will be the interfacing between biology and with the non-living. Uh, and this, I think, is a very interesting example that is very recent, has just been um, published uh, just a month ago, in which uh, the, uh, the group of Godfrey, the Kerstin Godfrey in Heidelberg, uh, was able to build DNA-based mimics of cytoskeletal elements that can reversible assemble. And when they are introduced inside a container, they are able to cargo. Uh, they are able to cargo a small vesicles uh, in the. This is quite spectacular. Uh, I don't have the movie, but um, you can go to the paper and see how this uh, DNA cytoskeleton is able to act as a um, bona fide cytoskeleton somehow. Another very important topic at the moment is. Uh, the formation of cellular bionics. Uh, and the idea will be to incorporate synthetic cells or synthetic modules or cell-like cell, cell-like containers inside the living cell and interface one with each other and introduce elements or communicate with the exterior. And to me, this is a very exciting topic for chemical biology. Uh, at the moment. And uh, last month, uh, Stephen Mann Group uh, has published a very intriguing experiment in which uh, they uh, use a coacerbate uh, uh, to which they um, are coupled with two types of bacteria, one inside and the other outside. They uh, break the bacteria and therefore the coacerbate start having the composition of the bacteria, and they form a kind of artificial cell with the bacterium derived membrane. And then they, inside, there were elements from, from bacteria and plasmids and so on. They were able to, to cleave the DNA and form a kind of nucleus-like structure. They managed to, incorp to incorporate inside this um, hybrid system actin and Finally, they were able to get a kind of um, um, construction or shape change uh, due to the action of actin fibers. You can, this to me is a very impressive um, uh, tour de force of, in chemical biology uh, in connection with uh, artificial cells. Um, regarding biofactories, uh, you can have. Uh, these synthetic cells probably will, will be important in green, to, in green solutions. Uh, to me, the most uh, relevant example is the, uh, the building of an artificial chloroplast to optimize light conversion and energy storage by the group of Tobias Erb at the Max plant. But also you can have examples. Uh, here is the, the scheme of this very spectacular uh, is, is example. Also, you can encapsulate biocatalytic reactions to improve biofuel and green chemical uh, production. Also, I think this probably will be part of the next generation of biorefineries, and hopefully it will also be useful for bioremediation. Regarding health, the most um, most remarkable at the moment achievement is uh, the testing new drugs and optimizing the effectiveness of existing drugs. And the idea will be that now it's possible to, 
target and control delivery of drugs in human bodies. Uh, and the group of Joaquin Spatz at Heidelberg that will come to Madrid uh, to give a talk in, in a few days uh, is the master on these technologies. And I think they are doing very intriguing and very interesting experiments. Just to finish, let me go also to the challenges for society. Well, you can imagine that this uh, synthetic cell research and the debate between living and living versus non-living matter, et cetera, and security issues and safety issues is a matter that had to be addressed. Uh, to me, uh, personally, I'm more in, uh, involved at the moment and also Sonsoles and Root on training future scientists because these disciplines will require novel ways of exploring living systems, engineering to understand and master biological complexity. Uh, Bruce Albers 20 years ago coined the term protein machines when he was addressing the universities uh, about the progress on molecular biology and how to prepare the next generation of molecular biologists and the cell as a collection of protein machines. Now, probably the cell as a factory uh, will, will require also new ways of understanding and approaching biological complexity. In this regard, uh, we have uh, organized a master on integrative synthetic biology that is an in-house experiment at the Research Council to, uh, uh, and it's the first graduate school on synthetic biology in which we are trying to integrate research and innovation on synthetic biology and having a very small number of students. Uh, and this is a two-year master that uh, I think we are very happy with it, but it's at the beginning and hopefully people will appreciate uh, in the future also the students because it's a way of putting the uh, the the everyday life in a, a pure research center also to transfer knowledge and technology for the new generations and this is the second edition regarding europe i mean uh, this synthetic cell is also being uh, uh, assembled in europe as a very important uh, um, challenge and now there is a European synthetic cell initiative in which we are also part of it and uh, we in fact define uh, uh, the, the, two, three years ago the, the first uh, synthetic cell uh, meeting was held in at the research council headquarters and there we define the challenges of this topic and is something that is now being going on and Spain is also present in this uh, initiative and the synthetic cell initiative is putting some numbers at least in the uh, regarding the time frame and as you can see we are talking about in a 20 30 years time frame and both sci scientific and technological uh, developments or achievements will are in the list I already mentioned them and I think these synthetic cell products will be important in what is now called circular economy, high-tech materials, or biomedicine. Uh, also, the Research Council uh, is, is, besides this European initiative, the Research Council uh, has the synthetic life as one of the challenges of the Research Council towards 230, I would put 50 better than 30 but this is my opinion um, and this is more or less uh, uh, the group that we uh, were involved in the in the writing of this chapter of this challenge Sonsole was among them uh, and also we already made a workshop on origins and synthesis of life uh, almost a year ago well six months ago in which we combine origins of life and synthetic life. And I think it was very interesting. And yes, I think we had good progress and the horizon I think is very promising. And with this, uh, this is just 
summary of what I, I mentioned before. I hope that I will convince you that assembling a minimal living unit with programmable function functionality is something worth uh, pursuing and it will allow us or will this effort will contribute to understand how life works and also will help to uh, um, will will help uh, the future of our society uh, regarding environment and health problems this is our laboratory after 25 years of exploration i'm very thankful to all of them and also this is the list of our collaborations that also we share explorations and receive a lot of help to continue exploring from them uh, thank you for your attention thank you very much herman thank you so much so i see at least in the soon there is no questions yet but yeah. i'm i'm going to maybe mar is there any question in the youtube not yet but i have a couple of questions yeah. probably uh, and also you can uh, give them my well i can put my email uh, and ah, they can perfect. send me questions if, ah, they perfect. Wish. if they if they if they wish after talking let, this let is me, perfect let me put the the just in case they want to okay okay this is Herman, not, yes tell amazing, me. amazing talk about uh, you have give us a, a perfect overview of the synthetic bi biology field and and which are the the current uh, or the next uh, steps to 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 be achieved. And I, I, regarding the health topic, I, I, I don't know nothing about uh, this, this topic, no, but, but I am a complete ignorant. But how the synthetic, synthetic machineries are supposed to interact with the cellular systems? Uh, it, uh, I mean, uh, there is any possibility to activate that they uh, were able to activate the immune system? Uh, or these are part of the challenge that, that, that the people that is working with these machineries uh, have to, to, to achieve? Or, or... Yes, I, I think that, uh, for example, in the case of, uh, let me see, in the case of drug systems, uh, mm -hmm. I think that this is more or less analyzed. I think I had here the, let me see here. Well, the idea is that they target uh, the individual. I mean, the idea will be uh, to combine. Uh, you can target the in the eukaryotic system is is easier than in bacterial system to incorporate liposomes. Uh -huh. uh, and the idea will be like, uh, well, this is a very old uh, topic uh, to to incorporate liposomes as drug carriers. The idea yeah. now is that you can functionalize these uh, cargos. I mean, these um, um, containers and the idea mm. will be to uh, somehow um, target with the specific molecules in the outer part of the of the of the vesicle and then to introduce inside the the the, the cellular system or even in the blood stream. It, it will depend on the cases. Mm -hmm. But I think this is now a matter of um, um, engineer the container uh, both from outside and from inside uh -huh. and I know that for example in other cases this has been already uh, accomplished uh, uh -huh. therefore also uh, it's like always if you introduce something that is exogenous you had to uh, somehow hide uh, it uh, in a certain or control how to introduce it, it uh, to, to avoid uh, that it's being um, in, uh, seen as a very uh, um, exogenous material and it's been destroyed. But uh, uh -huh. these are things that have been uh, or are, are under development. On, uh -huh. on, on. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. this is the part that I, I, I understand the least. Uh, I'm more in the in the fundamental aspects of the integration of modules. But I know that this is being developed a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. In so the pharma, in the pharma yeah. industry also. Thank you very much, Herman. Um, I, I have also some questions. 
the first one is up, um, from the ignorance. <laughs> How much do you control the chemical composition and the homogeneity of these uh, synthetic cell systems? How much can you control on that? I mean, can you define, I want, I want this target, I want my um, uh, synthetic cells to be like this or, and, I, and how homogeneous are these uh, synthetic cells? Well, there are, here there are many approaches because there are people that, pre, let, let me go to one of these schemes that I had here. There are a lot of controversy around that. There are people that uh, uh, think, oh, I should have something that is very homogeneous. Let's put it with microfluidics. You can get containers that are all the same. But other people feel that doesn't need to be so homogeneous. And you can get um, different populations and at the end they will work. Yeah. Uh, there are a debate on that. And also here, what is now a, a very important topic uh, regarding, for example, in the case of, um, let me see here, uh, see here, 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 for example, here uh, that uh, will be probably easier to understand. The idea will be is needed to have a, an elongated shape or all these things at the moment are, are still under a lot of uh, investigation because you had an alternative will be to work with uh, not microfluidics or not microfluidic devices. You can get heterogeneous systems, but also heterogeneous in size. And, and the idea now is that the people is trying to control, in the case of the containers, they are trying to control the size uh, uh, in the and also the shape and yeah. also in the case of the interior you can add either exogenous uh, the proteins or you can have this uh, uh, cell-free system that will allow you to to produce the proteins inside uh, is obviously it's still a lot of effort mm -hmm. to be done to control the systems at will but mm -hmm. in many cases, perhaps it's not needed that everything are, are completely homogeneous in size. For example, uh, this yeah. is what people think on some of these drug delivery systems, that you don't need to have all of them exactly the same. I mean, uh, at the end, that is not uh, the key part. Mm -hmm. uh, and also in the origin of life, uh, there are groups that say that why we had to have containers all equal. Maybe you need a, a, a window of sizes and shapes and see in which one you, you, you get some a, a emergence of um, cell-like activities. Yes, I was thinking uh, also in, in the applications as smart, for instance, to be used in, as with um, therapeutic applications that you, you need to define the systems uh, and know. And of course, apart from drug delivery, I guess that, that an, another field is to, to insert enzymes and even receptors in some, for some yes. diseases that maybe the receptors are uh, mutated or they, they so well, the, for sure there is a, a long um, travel to be performed, but also uh, lots of things to, to learn in the travel. That is, is but uh, regarding chemical biology, uh, besides the um, reconstructing cellular machines, also I think that at the moment a key, a, a key topic is this one, that the possibility of uh, biomimetic systems in which you can use uh, supramolecular chemistry and colloidal chemistry to, to build cell-like systems. And apparently what I heard from some of my colleagues, um, the creation of new materials is going to be very important, uh, at least at the short term. Probably some of the issues regarding health applications will take longer because also you had to deal with the complexities of the, of the host. You know what I mean? But, uh, but here, uh, and this is why the development of drug delivery system is the most advanced because 
already the liposome uh, was being used as a as a drug delivery system for more than 30 years and therefore this will be like a a, a fancier or a more advanced mm -hmm. liposome like system but uh, the, uh, if i were a a, a a a young chemical biologist i will think on this topic uh, <coughs> the creation of materials that will resemble and there are groups in spain and in many that are doing already these kind of things with cytoskeletal filaments, for example, in Santiago. And this topic is very important for um, industry. This is what they told me. Um, okay. And also Herman. to understand biochemistry, uh, that will be very important. The, the previous topic in which I mentioned the cell cycle. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it will be very yes important. of course yes this is a very pros promising field with a and also it's, going, it's, it's very much connected to system chemistry because you yeah. have to integrate a uh, molecular <laughs> machines and that is not trivial not at all but uh, yeah. well the, um, we have a lot of things to, to learn and also to work in so oh this is you. at the beginning <laughs> Yes. Therefore, this is a, 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 yeah. a, a big avenue for young people, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thank you very much, Herman. You're welcome. I think this we've had a very nice overview and complete and updated and of uh, and, uh, synthetic biology and synthetic cell research and all the challenges that are waiting for us. Mm -hmm. So okay. thank you very much. Thank I, you. I will. I will. Uh, and share the presentation. Great. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, we are going to move now to our second speaker, to Dr. Ruth uh, Perez. I, I will remind the title. Well, I, I think I didn't tell you. The title of her talk is Insights into Biological Targets Through Dynamic Chemical Systems. So th Ruth, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will share my screen and put it in. Uh, do you see it all right? Yeah. Perfecto. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this webinar. It's really a pleasure for me to present the work we have been doing in our group regarding how to get insights into biological targets using uh, chemistry, dynamic chemical systems. So uh, at the beginning, I would like to introduce you to the term adaptation, just to, you have to keep this in mind when you, you analyze our chemical systems. Adaptation in general refers to the process where members of a population become better suited to their environment. Uh, sometimes we can uh, mix this term with uh, the strongest members, but uh, that's not true, as you will see. It's not the strongest, it will be, become better shoot, the one that can adapt to the changes we are going to introduce in our chemical systems. So if we transfer this concept to chemistry, we have to think of a mixture of compounds that will reshape, they will make different type of connections uh, because the chemistry we're going to use can uh, make and be undone as well. And this is uh, all related to the concept of dynamic combinatorial chemistry. We can have two kinds of systems. We can go to uh, systems under thermodynamic control. That will be the systems I will introduce you in this talk or to the other systems that are related to non-equilibrium life that is more related to Hermann's talk of systems chemistry. These last ones are also, we are doing them this in the group, but we are just starting to do them. That's why we will not present them now. And these are systems that need fuel to be continuously working, okay? So uh, for this chemistry, we need our chemicals that are like going to be like Lego pieces. We are going to have uh, around 10, 12, 50 building blocks that are called chemical bricks and uh, they will be part of a molecule or another. We can, like in this picture, we can use them either to make a car, but if we disassemble it to make this, uh, this, this other one, then you would have to think that the, the, all the small bricks will have to reshape into this new, new, new formula, let's say this way. 
So how this uh, chemical sociology, how these building blocks will connect. So we have to, I'm going to explain here to you two different reversible reactions. This is the first one that is called the acyl hydrazone exchange that we need to have aldehydes and acyl hydrazides. And the last one is the thiol disulfide exchange where all our chemical rigs are going to be thiols, okay? So this is the functionalized building blocks. These chemical compounds are going to be our building blocks. They are going to be put into conditions that are under thermodynamic control, equilibrium. And as you can see, we have different compositions in this mixture, because here the important thing is which compound is more stable. And the most stable one will be in a higher proportion. But if we introduce changes to this uh, system, for example, if we introduce a target that in our case is usually a protein, you will see how this composition shifts. It's different from this one. We are using the same building blocks, but now the important thing is which complex with the protein is most stable. And usually this better complex refers to the best ligand selection. So in these cases, if we introduce a protein to our system, we're going to change this composition and the system will evolve uh, driven by the selection, the selection of our protein um, target. So if we compare this with the story of Alice in Wonderland, you remember Alice in Wonderland, she wasn't never with the right size for whatever she was trying to do. If she wants to cross a small door, she was too tall. And if she wanted to reach the key, she was too small. So that these problems Alice had, let's say it this way, it doesn't happen with our chemical systems because they are going always to reshape, to adapt to the new conditions. So we are going to use this chemistry in two uh, different um, parts. The first one, we're going to use them as chemical keys to unlock several biological targets. And these systems are going to be directed with the protein. So protein directed dynamic combinatorial chemistry. And on the other hand, I'm going to show you how we can um, adapt the chemistry to make it more uh, efficient. So we are going to develop different reversible uh, chemistry uh, catalysts, okay? With this catalyst, we can make or build hybrid systems, and we also help to make more efficient chemical networks. So, wait, okay. Now, for example, we, when we are thinking of chemical keys, we're thinking of molecules that can, for example, inhibit a protein. And up to present, you can do this in different ways. You have the chemistry by design, where you are looking for one key that is the right one for, for the protein lock. We can use like industry combinatorial chemistry that we can have a huge range of uh, compounds that you have called libraries and you can test all these keys, all these chemicals, and you can look for the right one. You can have from this box, compounds right one from kinase or for protease, ATC, but you are just doing combinatorially with the molecules that are already synthesized. On the other hand, our approach, dynamic combinatorial chemistry, you don't have the keys already constructed. You have fragments of keys that are in constant recombination. And only the best key is going to be selected by the log. So you will have in your mixture only selected the best compounds. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how we are going to send our chemical, uh, chemical components, our building blocks. They are going to act as drug hunters. They're going to look for pockets to interact with the protein uh, targets. And let's see how we can find new molecules that modulate these targets. The first uh, protein I would like to, to show you is this neuronal calcium sensor one that is associated to the neurodegenerative diseases, okay? We, we know that brain is really complex and is highly regulated. And that sometimes when you have a dysfunction, for example, in the number of synapses, you have, uh, you suffer from brain disease. This is an example here of two dendritic spines. One is of a healthy, a healthy person that is called control spine. And then the other one is one that is suffering from Alzheimer. And you see how the, number of uh, spines are really decreases. This is going to, to be really uh, generate 
and, and, and disease that is called synaptopathy that it occurs from one out of 25 people over 60 years old, sometimes it's related also with dementia. So our target is this neuronal calcium sensor that is a protein that is, uh, has got high affinity to calcium. It's like a, it's similar to calmoduli, and it has this EF hand calcium binding motif that is, uh, it consists of two alpha helixes that are connected to this uh, 12 amino acid uh, link. So we had, in principle, when we started with this project, we had already information about some inhibitors that were discovered from this protein. So we are going to try, in this case, to regulate interaction between a protein-protein interaction. This is the protein NCS1 and RIG8A that regulate this synaptic transmission. So the inhibitors that were discovered, they showed a decrease in the synapse number. So it's like the inhibitor was placed here, to say it this way, and it was attracting to itself an helix, helix 10, that was uh, preventing the interaction between these two proteins. These uh, inhibitors had important applications in fragile X syndrome and in autism spectrum disorders. What we, our objective was to see if we could find molecules that do completely the, the, the other role. This means to enhance and to recover the synapse number. So we could apply them in uh, diseases that are lack of synapse, like Alzheimer's, Huntington's, or Parkinson's disease. So we are going, our target is to find protein-protein interactions promoters or enhancers that could prevent the helix 10 turn inside the cavity of NCS1, and then to promote the interaction with rig So we set up our, our library. In this case is the first chemistry I have showed you, that is the chemistry of aldehydes with acyl hydrazides. You see here, we set up some conditions. We're working under low temperatures to preserve this protein target and under nitrile pH. You will have here the combination of this aldehyde with all these acyl hydrazides, okay? Like around five. We can have 10 compounds in two isomers, and this is what we discovered in this library. These libraries we're analyzing with HPSC MS. Here I have shown, I'm showing you the HPSC chromatogram traces, where you can see we identify with mass spectrometry which peak corresponds to which compound. Okay, these are in the absence of the protein. And after adding the protein, you see how this chromatography changes. If we uh, applicate some mathematical equations to see the amplification of the best compound, we obtain this result. Compound 3B was amplified above the other ones, E, D, A, and C. Compound 3B has got this indoltrine, and on the other side, the aldehyde, this hydroxy group and nitro compound, okay? So our next step is to study the affinity of this compound for the protein. So one of the experiments we perform in collaboration with NMR groups is the uh, interaction of the affinity of this compound with the protein. In the STD experiments, you see how close you can see the compound is and how long, for how long is close to the protein target. And the STD results confirm what we have seen in the HPLC. This means that compound 3B was the one that was amplified and that compound 3C didn't appear to have any affinity for the protein. So with this technique, we confirm the HPLC results. The, also with STD, we can, you can see how the molecule is, um, is inside this, this protein cavity or which uh, atoms of this uh, compound, is like the ep epitope, are closer or further from the protein with these colors. So in this case, we saw that these, these atoms, these carbon atoms from the uh, indoltrine were closer, and this one was a little bit far away. And for example, the OH wasn't even interacting. This was confirmed with the X-ray structure, where we could see how this compound was binding the human neural calcium sensor one in the hydrophobic crevice. As you see, the OH here is, doesn't appear to have 
to be in proximity to this protein. And here you can see how this porridge group is pointing outside the cavity. So another test we did was to estimate the binding constant. This was done using fluorometry. Okay, so we did fluorescent-based experiments with all compounds to see the binding constants, and they were all of them in the micromolar range. Up to now, I have shown you proof that we have compounds that are interacting with NCS1, but as well, our objective was to to perturb or to promote the interaction with, with uh, two proteins, we use here co-immunoprecipitation assays to see if NCS1 and Rick date would in fact bind. So here you can see how when we are in presence of compound 3B, this band gets uh, darker, gets more intense because more, more compound, more protein is binding to a Rick 8. And this is one of one of also the first tests we did, and we were quite uh, uh, surprised because it was the first time that someone was describing a promoter of these two protein-protein interaction. So since we are also wanted to transfer this knowledge to see if it can be applied really in the process of drug discovery, we need first to prove that we have um, permeability to the brain, that this compound could, could cross like by passive diffusion the blood brain barrier. This You can do this in the lab using a PAMPA studies, that is a parallel artificial membrane permeation assay. You have to put some controls of these experiments that like we did here. Some of them are neurodrugs, others are not. And you can see that here compound 3B proved to cross this blood brain barrier in this in vitro assay. So it could be a good candidate to study its property in an animal studies, for example. We also test before the cell toxicity of uh, this compound and compare it to CPZ, that is an antipsychotic drug. And we saw as well that uh, our percentage or our conditions to have this compound dissolved, that was with using a low amount of TMSO, was perfect for uh, regarding the cell toxicity. So our last uh, test with this compound was to see the in vivo effect of this compound in, uh, in an animal model. One of the easiest one we could work with was in Drosophila. So what they did was, uh, these studies of course are always in collaboration, they, they induced amyloid peptides in neurons to display Alzheimer's disease symptoms that are more or less uh, problems, uh, difficulty in locomotion and also memory loss. So we measured two things, the abdominal motor neurons and synapse number analysis and the fly locomotor activity. Here we have flies with AD symptoms, flies control. You see this is with the vehicle, the MSO, and in the presence of compound 3B, you can see how the flies with AD symptoms start behaving like the healthy flies, control flies. We saw the same behavior with this fly locomotor activity test that we have here, the, the, the flies with uh, Alzheimer's, fly controlled flies, and after providing the compounds, you see how these two columns more or less equilibrate. So this was the first uh, example where we could see synaptic recovery, where a compound was found to improve this interaction between the neuronal calcium sensor one and RIC88. And this was a way to discover that also Elix10 had a very important role in this protein-protein interaction. So when our next, for example, uh, application is completely different. It's an industrial application, also with some uh, biomedical one, is the glucose oxidase. We chose this enzyme because it's, uh, she's called the oxo oxidoreductase Ferrari. It, it's amazing. It has a fast mechanism of action. It's highly stable and also specific. It catalyzes this oxidation of the beta D glucose uh, molecule and uh, in the presence of uh, molecular oxygen. And uh, although it's well uh, known as being part of uh, an important application in biosensors, like for a glucose sensor, it's also uh, been applied as a food preservative because it has got an antimicrobial effect, also wound healing, and in cancer therapy since this protein increased the hypoxia level and it makes the tumor stars. 
So we consider this a quite interesting protein to work with and we use it in our next system. This time we change our reversible chemistry. We use this uh, thiol disulfide exchange. So for using this chemistry, we have we need thiols and we need uh, neutral or basic conditions to have active thiolates to do the exchange. Okay, because we these thiolates, we are going to attack a disulfide and they're going to start exchanging the compounds. We start with aromatic thiols, these benzene rings. The yellow uh, half spheres are thiols and the red squares are carboxylic acids that under neutral condition or basic are going to be carboxylates, giving us the solubility we need for this chemical system. Thiols, as you see, we can have cyclic thiols because we have two thiols or linear ones. And it gives this huge uh, mixture of different compounds like these trimers, these uh, dimers, tetramers, etc. So this is a complex mixture sometimes to analyze. It requires a huge chromatography effort. But as you can see, in the presence of the glutathione oxidase, we have the predominant amplification of this dimer of compound four, that is this monothiol. This compound four resembles also to one of the compounds that was uh, described as inhibitor of the glucose oxidase. So in the first example, I have shown you a free library of compounds because we didn't have a clue of which structure could work well with this protein. But with the glucose oxidase, when you have a candidate that could um, interact with the protein, you can use similar structures to look for new molecules. So here we analyze DTMB and this dimer of compound four. We saw that they, were, uh, they have affinity for this glucose oxidase like in the micromolar range. And we also do enzymatic assays and saw that both of them were non-competitive inhibitors. It's true that we didn't um, overpass these properties of the TMB that was 0.20 as inhibitor, but we get another wood one that was with 1.7 that is also okay. And we also discovered new structure that was interacting and could modulate, inhibit in this case, the glucose ox uh, oxidase uh, action. So now as the second part, I'm going to show you how you can uh, work with these chemical systems and make them more efficient. Now, uh, this chemistry, dynamic combinatorial chemistry is applied in many organic solvents, but it's true that in water with my own molecules is less developed okay? because we have to work under a reasonable time frame with proteins. We cannot have systems equilibrating during two weeks. We need them to do it more or less overnight. And these need to have some catalysts, some small molecules that doesn't um, uh, interact with the, with the target protein, but could speed our process. So with these two examples of chemistries, this chemistry, the first one that we have seen in the, in the first example, it works very good at acidic pH, but if you want to go and work with it under neutral basic conditions, you need a catalyst. The same thing happens with thiol disulfide exchange. It's a very nice chemistry that we can see in many biological processes. It's favored at neutral basic pH, but sometimes it needs long equilibration times. And that is something that we cannot uh, uh, wait for when we are using proteins. If, and of course, if they are sensitive proteins, is something that we have to, to solve. So in this case, this hyrosome bone, I'm sure you are all familiar with it because it's a very versatile molecular tool. Usually you use it in bioconjugations and it's favorite at acidic pH, as you can see here. But at neutral conditions, we have problems in chemistry to eliminate this hydroxy group and gets to the final compound. So um, one of the, of the other researchers group, they discover that if we use aniline as catalyst, you can introduce like uh, to circumvent this mechanism, just forming these sheep bases and then going through another mechanism where this compound can exchange with these molecules easily, going through this intermediate of reaction and going to the acyl fi final acyl hydrazone formation. This is because these uh, amino bases are very uh, easy to hydrolyze under, um, in water. 
So this is the advantage of using this intermediate in this reaction. So we wanted to see if we could get different catalysts than the one that they were published, more biocompatible. So we choose one of our chemical systems here, and we observe what happened with this reaction under different uh, aniline derivatives with different groups that make this aniline more nucleophilic, more reactive. So we saw, for example, that in the absence of the of catalyst, in the absence even of aniline, we have this uh, constant one. But for example, and if we see here the, this, uh, this graph that is representing the formation of compound 3B without catalyst, you know that this looks like infinite. Okay, we can be more than seven hours and the reaction hasn't finished. In the presence of aniline, we have a nicer curve serve that is like 2.6, and this more or less this green draft. You see, with aniline, we get really an improvement with this compound, but the better one, or the one that showed really great improvement, is uh, using paranisidine, that is this amino ometoxy compound derivative that cause like five times faster the reaction. And this in our scheme is, is, is pretty good. And also this compound should to be like more, was good solubility and more biocompatible. So this, we did this study with different parts. I have shown you the one in water, and we also did the studies by NMR and computational mechanical, quantum mechanical calculations to see if we could get also better aniline derivative. Here we have, we test another molecules like uh, with uh, methyl or methoxy and, and, and bromide. We, and we studied the reaction, like treating it like two different steps, how these compounds perform in the first reaction, that is the formation of the amine base, and how it performs the second reaction, that it was the, in fact the exchange or the hydrosol formation. So we observe here that, for example, if you have a compound that promotes the first step, in this case was paranicity, you see here the constants is the one with the better binding constant. This compound didn't perform as well the second reaction, of course, because this was like more stable. So in fact, at the end, we need to consider a good compromise between the speed of this aniline derivative performing the imine, uh, the, the imine uh, compound or also the, the, the fact that they have to perform very good exchange, releasing, breaking up this imine shape, the a bond and forming the acyl hydrazine compound. In this case, we had two good candidates that were compound for B and for C. This means this uh, for C is the paranisidine and for B is with the methyl group. And we use them in the next step is what will happen with this compound because these NMR studies were done in acetonitrile, what happens with these compounds in water? And in water, as you can see here, also with another reaction that we set up, we confirm that, for example, compound 4C, that was the paranisidine that was described before, was given a better performance than compound, for example, 4B. So in fact, to different uh, techniques and doing different uh, studies, we also, uh, confirmed that one of the best uh, compounds that people could use in this acyl hydrazine exchange with introducing the paranisidine catalyst instead of the aniline that was previously reported. And now this is like uh, the last part of my talk that is uh, talking about the sulfur role in dynamic combinatorial chemistry. Uh, disulfate exchange is one of the most used ones. Because not only because you can see here many applications of uh, sulfur in chemistry and biology, but one of them that is here marked with the, with the king crown is the disulfide bond formation. So it's involved in everything. And we were also interested in protein folding. So here, this chemistry is favored when it's under basic conditions, obviously, because we need this, mole this atom to be like negatively charged to start the exchange with a disulfide bond. But sometimes this, this bond is not as fast as we would like to. Sometimes it takes weeks to react the full library and we need it to be become faster. So how we 
did this. How can we speed this thiol disulfate exchange? We, we had to look at nature and see how nature has improved sometimes the, the thiol enzymes. And then we saw the example of this uh, thiol reduction reductase that was using selenium instead of a sulfur to make this reduction. Okay, And it is proposed that it is, uh, selenium acts in two different mechanisms, either like a nucleophile attacking this uh, disulfide bond of this substrate, or becoming here the electrophile accepting electrons from this redox center of the thioredoxin. So then we have in mind, okay, we need to introduce selenium in our dynamic combinatorial chemistry. And that is what we thought. Okay, if this is the standard thiol disulfate exchange, it goes like this. If we had selenium in a state of thiols, they will behave in a similar way. We'll have this selenium exchange. But what would happen if we have, for example, selenium, a diselenium compound in our library, and we put it in the presence of our thiols? Okay, that's what we try to study. Will we, can we get this easily breakable intermediate of, with selenium to speed up our DCL? And it's what we, what we studied. So we thought about different compounds of selenium that we wanted to test. And then we found one really interesting one that was selenocysteine. Selenocysteine was really comparable in our lab. We could make the studies very easily to compare with this, uh, with this, uh, with this molecule. So then we say, okay, we take this library that you are familiar with it because it's the one we use with the glucose oxidase that is made of thiols and of carboxylates and aromatic rings. And let's see what happens when we use slight amount of selenium in this library. So as you can see, this is the full chromatogram of the chemistry. This is the chemistry with the cysteine that takes like three days to, to finish. And when we change this thing with selenocysteine, it took just 24 hours. So this was a great change in our DCL that we need also to confirm that like we have done it with the other chemistry, doing really measuring how long and the and the, the constants, the catalytic constants of this reaction. So here we test different percentage of selenium. We also test the MSO that as you know, is a, an oxidant and could also play a role in our library. And we also compare it with the enzyme itself and also in the absence of, of selenium here. And this is what we got. We got, for example, that amazing, just using 2.5%, that is really a small amount of selenium in our DCS, we could get around 20 times to speed up this DCL, this, uh, this formation in this case of the compound. What was quite impressive at that time, because this then, this will enable us to use DCC, to use this molecule in our libraries to speed them up, and also to see what role has this compound in protein refolding. So the first thing we need to know is using this selenium is going to interfere in our library. It's going really to interfere with, with making synthetic receptors or maybe to, to, to see if we can get a best ligand to a protein. This, you have seen it in with the glucose oxidase. It didn't interfere. Now we're going to see the role that the selenium can have we are going to try to make a synthetic receptor of some molecules. So in this case, we use a spermine as template. So the template is, we are going to use in a set of a protein that I have talked to you about is a small biomolecule like spermine. So we try to use first a very simple library of two building blocks and see what happens. When you have these two building blocks, in the absence of the spermine, we have this library composition with and without selenium. In the presence of the, of the template of the spermine, you can see here that we have the amplification and formation of this tetramer of compound two, this one that has got two thiols and two carboxylates, and this synthetic receptor of the spermine is reported to have 21 nanomolar affinity for this molecule. We saw that in the presence of selenium, this, the library was speeded like four times, but fortunately it didn't interfere with the recognition process. So we could see again, the same tetramer amplified. 
we try a more complex library using different building blocks. And then we saw the same effect that we could use up to 5% mole of this selenium that we could still see that in the presence of spermin, the same tetramer, synthetic receptor of spermin was, um, was formed. So those were good news because selenium is not interfering with our chemical libraries. The last thing we wanted to test is uh, selenium in a biological system. We know that proteins have multiple disulfide bonds that they need to be arranged in a certain way. We also were aware that uh, red of buffers, such so as uh, these uh, glue that GCSSG and GCH are used usually to enable the right folding. And we wanted to test the ability to tune this thiolysulfate frame changes these redox agents in a protein and refolding process. So one of the proteins that uh, is like a mother protein is the scramble RNAs that you know that it's, we use the oxidized one, not the reduced one. So we had already formed these disulfide bonds, but they were not correctly assembled. Okay, so we tried to see if using selenium in a state of GSSG in combination with SH, we could get the right native RNA folding. And this uh, can be done testing the percentage of activity that has got these native RNAs. In this case, the activity of this protein, when it's uh, like native, you can follow it by uh, hydrolyzing this um, cyclic monophosphate, okay? And then is what we did. This is uh, the test we did was in the presence of the standard red dot buffer, we have this percentage of folding in this time. And as you can see, when we change this compound with the senocysteine, we do this much faster, okay? We have like a 92% per, uh, folding when with the standard buffer, we were around 70, something like that. We got, ah, here it is, 92% yield of folding in 65 minutes. And then we have the same one with 30, 391 minutes. So this was quite good news. And also a uh, thing that we also reported is that with this redox buffer, you can only work under neutral basic conditions, but with selenium, we even tried to refold the protein under acidic conditions, and we could get also the right folding, whereas with this redox standard buffer, we couldn't. So we find that, um, for us, what's really impressive to see that we can transfer what we learn with the chemical systems to biological ones and test them with, with good results. So just to finish as conclusions, I hope I have shown you how catalysts enable that these uh, chemical systems are more effective and they can be also be used, widely used in the presence of biological targets and also we can think of the performing hybrid systems, okay? This catalyst of disulfide and hydrogen formation increase also the building blocks you can use because if you can make the chemistry works faster, you can use less reactive building blocks what increase the number of chemicals you can put in your reactions. And also to, to lead in the future to assembly driven self replication systems that is important to work really fast and effective. And also that if you use uh, proteins as template and you, you generate this protein directed dynamic chemical system, also powerful tools for finding protein modulators and getting insights into biological targets when sometimes you don't have much information of your protein, or you can find it also using these um, pocket hunters. So Thank you very much. This is the groups I have uh, have been part of these uh, collaborations in this in this work I have showed to you. Well, this is my email here. You have any question that doesn't come up now, you can uh, write me later and ask me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank yeah. you for this nice approach to uh, combinatorial dynamic chemistry and. Uh, and, and the, the, all the possibilities uh, that we can use on different applications. So uh, I don't see any questions. So while somebody asks, I am going to ask you a question regarding this, the last part, 
with the selenium uh, work that you have, um, which is the, so do, do, do you think that the presence of this, um, the, the, this process is in the refolding, in the presence of selenium uh, are so quick because um, the, there must be, I suppose, I don't know, which is the reason the selenium derivatives are, are not as uh, stable as the thiol analogs. So is, is this the reason that uh, why the, 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 the refolding occurs more rapidly? Yeah I, is yeah, I think it has to do, like we, when we see in chemistry that when you link two heteroatoms together, this bond is weaker. And we mm -hmm. want to make a, a protecting groups that works well. Usually they work very well when it's heteroatom plus heteroatom. I, I think the key here is to have selenium sulfur intermediates that are easy breakable. And uh, yeah, what I was surprised is that it wasn't used more often. So. Probably yeah, because just... selenium is really stinky. I mean, chemistry in the lab has to do it before the weekends. So <laughs> probably that, that's one of the reasons. But from a practical point of view, if you can perform protein folding also under acidic conditions, you are also gaining there some pH, uh, a broad pH range to work to work with. And uh, the, I think it's, it's, uh, it's key also with some proteins. I think it's more familiar, yeah. And have you find, found any kind of uh, competition with other functional groups? So is, is this an um, orthogonal <laughs> method <laughs> only <Yeah>. for <laughs> thiol? Uh, yeah, I, I, haven't, or... I haven't observed anything. And I would have been able of doing it because with the building blocks, we mix different structures and we ne never identify another weird intermediate or something that was going on that I'm not saying that it will never happen but at least mm -hmm. what we have observed is pretty clean and uh, the only problem I have seen is uh, the smell if you want to say like this but apart from that I think it's very effective and good to work with with selenium. Good and, and in the case of the combinatorial chemistry uh, the dynamic combinatorial chemistry. Do you uh, do you have the possibility to do more than one round uh, of selection? Or, or... Yeah. It. Uh, I mean, the thing that we use these small libraries is because we want to be sure that we are identifying the right compounds. Uh -huh. The problem we can have is an analytical problem. We can mix chemically two hundred compounds, but if we cannot identify which one is one because we have. Uh, difficult mixture to separate chromatography yeah. talking, then that is our limit, yeah. what we can detect. Uh -huh. so when I show you this library, but of course we have set up other libraries. It was the most successful one with this compound 3B, but you can make the number of libraries you want, just like two days work. So it's not a big deal. For uh -huh. me, it's more complicated to synthesize, have people synthesizing uh, thousands of compounds that never go anywhere because they don't have affinity okay. than to invest sometimes in setting up libraries and have a clue of the structural requirements that are the better one for your target. And the idea is that you are li limited by the conditions in which the protein is well formed, no? Yes, but that is, that's why we are working on the chemistry as well. Uh, there are people, I mean, of course, in Europe that are working in uh, identifying these protein directed chemical systems. That is good. But we also want to work with broad ranges of pH, with broad ranges of temperatures. Uh -huh. And for that reason, you need molecules to help you to do this thing better. Uh -huh. That's what our group aims to search in this chemistry that is not being developed in water because. It aim wasn't to work with biological targets. So we are working hard to develop this chemistry in water to be able to, to have more biomolecules or more targets to, to go to. And also to work, for example, some proteins need to work under low temperatures and chemistry is not favored at low temperatures. So that's why we need to, we need to do this work because of that. Because okay. we want to, to work broad range of temperatures, broad range of pHs, and uh, with a broad range of building blocks. Uh -huh. That's why we have to do that. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Ruth. I, I think thank since you. we don't have more questions, maybe we can just thank our two speakers, Professor Germán Rivas and Dr. Ruth Pérez. Thank you very much for, for your talk and presenting your work. And also thank you to the participants, to the to the two talks, although they were very silent, <laughs> but <laughs> I hope it was interesting for, for them, these two topics that we brought here for this seminar. Uh, so thank you uh, to you also, Sonsoles, for organizing this, this webinar and, and see you in the next webinar uh, from the same. Bye. Thank you, goodbye. Vale, vale, pues ya estamos.